Welcome everybody to the last session of the day. Um, glad to see so many people here, so thanks for joining. Um, the title of the talk is Deployment Options for OSGI Applications in the Cloud Edge, and you can assume Cloud Edge is in the title because otherwise it wouldn't be selected. No, just kidding. Um, yeah, titles. Um, short introduction to myself, my name is Dirk Fauth. I'm a research engineer at the ETES GmbH, which is a 100% subsidiary of Bosch. Um, yeah, I'm an Eclipse committer for several years, and actually this year is my 10-year anniversary at the Eclipse Con, so for 10 years I'm speaking at the Eclipse Con consecutively. Um, and I'm feeling proud to be a part of the Eclipse Con every year since 10 years. Um, that's the short uh, agenda, so I will talk about deployment variants, containers, because I want to go into the Cloud Edge with the Java application, um, and a small benchmark I did. Uh, people that know my talks know that I have much more content than time, so sorry if I'm speaking too, st uh, too, too fast. Um, that said, let's start immediately. Deployment variants in Java in general. Um, when you think about deployment variants of your Java applications in Java, the first thing you probably know is that you can have a bunch of jars, and this is what you ship to your customer. And if you ship that to your customer, uh, the customer needs on the desktop also Java JRE to run it. Nothing really new. Uh, the other deployment variant that is quite a general known is an executable jar. That means all my content is put into a single jar, there are basically two options. Um, you can flatten it, which was a process that was, uh, can be done via Maven. So all the jars are exploded into one single jar. With OSGI, that doesn't work, of course. The other option is that you have an executable jar that embeds all the other jars. And also here, you need a Java JRE installed on your host system so you can run your Java application. Since Java 9, there is another option for deploying your Java application you can create a custom runtime image using the JLink tool that is provided by the JDK. That is not known by many people still, especially in the OSGI context because it was not possible to build it. But I come to this later. In that case, you build your custom runtime image. You don't need the runtime on your system to run your application. And um, the fourth option, the Graal VM, creating a native executable. And by the way, for those who haven't heard, two days ago Oracle announced that they will uh, contribute the Graal VM Java stuff to the OpenJDK. So that will probably make the Graal VM even more popular in the Java world. Now, let's have a look on how these deployment modes look for an OSGI application. Well, having all the jars in, in a folder and you have, an, uh, you have your uh, Eclipse or OSGI framework here and you have this folder type. Um, yeah, the class loading is done by the OSGI jar and most prominent, the Eclipse IDE is shipping this way in, in folders. The second option, creating an executable jar, is for OSGI people as easy as um, for, for typical Java developers because we have the BND tools. And the BND tools is the uh, Swiss army knife of OSGI. It, it helps you in a lot of uh, places, generating manifest files and so on. And they have a nice export plugin in Maven and even in Gradle. Uh, so you can build your executable jar uh, in a single build step, which makes it very easy uh, to create and share. The custom JRE via JLink, well, yeah, that's a tool by the JDK. Um, and it says, assemble and optimize a set of modules and their dependencies into a custom runtime image. And this is where the struggle begins for OSGI because OSGI itself is a module system and the compatibility with the JPMS is not really given. So if you try to J-link an application, uh, your OSGI application built on folders or the executable jar, you will 
probably get errors like the, the one at the bottom. Automatic module cannot be used with JLink. The reason is most OSGI bundles do not provide a module info class. Why, why should they? They have their own um, module information. They always add automatic module into the manifest file, but JLink doesn't like that. Um, and if we look into the Graal VM, well, it also says the native image uh, is cre uh, created, statically linked. Um, there's a native image tool, and you can use the, the input uh, from a class. Well, nobody has a single class that you want to create a native image of. Um, a jar, so a class path, or a module path. And you have a closed world assumption, means all the bytecode that should be run at runtime needs to be known at build time. That doesn't match to the Equinox principle, where everything is dynamic. And so the class loading of OSGI, where the framework itself is doing class loading per bundle, doesn't match with the native tool of the GraalVM. I just added one exception I got. Um, so I got, for example, the null pointer exception that a null service reference is not allowed. Actually, I knew already about the problem that this doesn't match, and I stopped here and did no further investigation. So if we look at this picture with the information we now have and how I started, well, yeah, I can create an executable jar with BND tools, very cool. But the JLink doesn't work, and the GraalVM also doesn't work. Um, I wouldn't stand here if this would be the end of the road. So let's have a look on how we can get uh, ahead of this. Custom JRE via JLink via OSGI. Well, what's missing in our bundles is the module info. Well, there are tools that help you in generating the module info. For example, there is this tool called Modetect. And the tool Modetect, you can um, integrate it into your Maven build. And um, it is able to generate the module info even for third-party libraries. The problem I have with this approach is that I'm taking a third-party library, and then I'm modifying it, and I need to know what I have to modify to get the module info, and then I'm creating a new artifact that I want to publish to my customers. Well, there are struggles with the open source licenses, uh, checksums. Is the artifact I'm pushing to my customer really the original one, or is there something inside? So security scanners typically don't like this. Um, yeah, and you need some knowledge of the internals because you need to know what should be inside your module info. So it works, um, but I'm not a big fan of it for the production reasons. Um, but I'm a fan of this one. So BND Tools introduced JPMS support. Actually, it was Ray Auger who did this uh, a while ago, and he also created a nice example on this that I used as a base for my starts. Um, and this has two, two nice features. One thing is, you can enable the creation of a module info for your own bundles. So you simply add this uh, instruction to your BND file, or here in, in the Maven plugin, and let it generate um, the module info for you. Um, here I added this example because this is one of the examples where you can see that JPMS is not really ahead of the OSGI module system because it's actually uh, on, on a bundle level your requirements and not on a package level. So here you see, um, for example, the Arc Apache Felix config admin. Felix has the principle to include also the service interfaces. So the package Arc OSGI service CM is provided by this uh, bundle. But as the information is derived from what we know, there is a dependency on org OSGI service CM, which is a different module in the space, because only the one that has the interfaces. So you will get errors if you don't handle this, uh, this way with the JPMS stuff. But I don't want to get in this because it doesn't solve our third party pro problem. I said we have problems with the third party. Um, that means we can also leverage this because we can introduce these two instructions, the JPMS module info, um, 
in a BND run file. What this does is actually, it makes the executable jar that was exported itself a module. And that's a really nice trick because then I can use my executable jar as a module for the JLink. These are the two instructions. Sorry, that was too fast. The two instructions um, where you can see I'm using my executable jar here for the JLink creation, and then I can launch it uh, by saying, please call the, um, the main class of my app. Pictures taken. But the slides are also published. Um, so having that in mind, Hey, now we can create a JLink image out of our um, OSGI application. It's not possible via the jars because of the module uh, problems, but we can uh, create it from the executable jar. Okay, let's have a look at the um, Graal VM. Well, I make it short because you can have talks about OSGI Connect itself, and there are very good talks about OSGI Connect and Apache Felix the Thomas already there, and here are the links uh, to those talks. Um, but in short, with OSGI R8, the OSGI Connect specification was added, and that allows you to start your OSGI application, well, without the module layer. So you can have your OSGI application on a plain class path, or you can have it on a plain module path. You don't need the dynamic class loading of the OSGI framework. That said, in short, um, well, what, what do I need in, to do in preparation to make it work? Well, I need to add this Atomos project, which is the implementation of the OSGI Connect uh, specification, to my application. I need to generate uh, the so-called reachability metadata um, because, well, OSGI is highly reflective and highly dynamic, and I need to tell this at the generation time. Um, what helps is the tracing agent that can be found, uh, the documentation can be found on, on the GraalVM page. And, well, even the generated stuff didn't work for me, so I had to update things to make uh, the stuff work. Um, actually, the Atomos project has a nice Maven plugin for the generation. Um, uh, my problem with this, uh, I will tell you later. Um, but. That's the basic principle, and also the Atomos Maven plugin is actually doing this. Um, well, then we are building, and yeah, we have two ways to build. Um, we can use uh, the Graal VM build plugins in Maven or Gradle, or we can use a Docker multi stage build. And well, some notes, remarks, because that was struggling me for a while. Um, the native image build only works with a flat class path by listing all the jars explicitly. It says it works with modules. I tried it with the modules. It says strange errors, not really speaking errors. Then I thought, OK, I'm creating a native image. What it takes as input doesn't matter if it's module path or class path. It's the result that matters, not the way. Um, so I used a class path with a folder. I got strange errors saying that folder or the content in the folder is invalid. Then I tried the folder with a asterisk. Still, some errors that, could not, that do not really tell you what's wrong. The only thing that really worked was um, the class path and listing every jar explicitly. Thanks uh, to shell scripting, this can be leveraged. Um, yeah, my problem actually with the, uh, with the Maven approach is that the build result is platform dependent. So if I run it on my Windows machine, I get a Windows executable. How should I put this into a Linux container? There are also so, uh, solutions for this, I will show shortly. And the last thing uh, is that the executable, the native executable needs the bundles for some introspection stuff. Because at the time when Atomos was implemented, introspection was not supported by the Graal VM. And to get the bundle headers for the resolution, finding the services, and all of that stuff, 
um, yeah, you needed to pass the, the jars to get these informations, and you need to put them in a Thomas lib folder next to the native executable. If you don't do this, your application don't start with strange errors. Um, there is already a ticket open at uh, Thomas saying that with GraalVM 22 introspection is supported. If someone finds the time to fix it in a Thomas, then this would be something uh, that's not needed in the future anymore. And yeah, I still have some issues in my native executable that doesn't work, uh, but I'm not sure if an SCR list in a native executable console is really a use case. Uh, but anyhow, it's a still an issue. Not everything is working as smooth as it should. So having that in mind with a Thomas um, uh, or Apache uh, OSGI Connect, I, well, I still can't create the JRE because I'm missing still the module info. But I can create a Graal VM out of my multiple jars. On the other hand, I'm ca I cannot use the executable jar to create a Graal VM. And there's currently a bug that, uh, well, the executable jar, if I integrate a Thomas in it, doesn't start because of some URL resolving issues. I also created a ticket on this. Hopefully, Ray and uh, Thomas will work on this. Um, but right now, it doesn't work. But I can use it to create a custom JRE. That's a strange thing, because the executable jar does not work, but the resulting JLink does. Um, quite funny, but that's the state. So having the pic this picture with Felix or Thomas and the picture before with plain OSGI in mind, it comes that I can have six different deployment variants. So I have the multiple jars in a folder with plain OSGI, I have my executable jar, and I have a JLink, but I have no GraalVM. If I integrate a Thomas, I can create multiple jars in a folder. The executable jar does currently not work. Um, I can create a custom JRE, and I can create a GraalVM image. Okay, we now know what are our deployment variants. Let's talk about containers. Why should we talk about containers? I said this talk is about cloud and edge. Well, we need containers. And yeah, in that case, size matters. I have seen many people that create containers for their Java applications starting from 500 megabytes to gigabytes. And well, depending on the use case, Maybe for some use cases where this container is only started once and runs for hours or days, that's okay. If you create small command line applications inside a container for a CI pipeline, such huge containers that are um, created, uh, that are used to create containers from over and over again, all over the day, it's a mess. I mean, you're paying for this. You're paying for size in the cloud and you're paying for data transfer in the cloud. Transferring a gigabyte 800 times a day, well, guess the cost. Um, and also guess the time that it takes to set up your pipeline, for example, because it takes time to download a gigabyte. And yeah, I know cloud administrators will now tell me images can be cached, but I want a continuous deployment. So Obviously, my container might change over, over the day multiple times. So if I have a long cache, my updates won't come in. So there are ups and downs. So if we think about creating small containers, let's see on the options. The first thing we need to look at is what is our base image? And if you're looking in the, in the internet for it, you find these comparisons. It's always Alpine versus a Debian Slim or a Ubuntu Jemmy, which is actually quite similar to the Bullseye Slim. Uh, they are all, uh, so Ubuntu is also Debian based. The main difference is that Alpine is using a libc implementation that is Musil, which is pretty small, while the libc implementation used by Debian is glibc. And with all the dependencies and stuff, you see directly the, the effect. An Alpine uh, with an, a Musil has five, five and a half megabytes, while a Bullseye Slim with the glibc directly has 80 megabytes. The next thing to think about is when I create my container, a which JRE should I use? So 
in this case, I'm, I'm comparing Tamarin with IBM Semaru because Semaru uh, builds on OpenJ9. Both are Eclipse projects. This is the EclipseCon, so let's only look at these two. And yeah, the typical question, JDK via JRE. Often people do not think about which is the base image, the Java image, and they directly get a JDK image. And you can see that a JDK, even on Alpine, has 350 megabytes compared to the JRE Alpine 168 megabytes. Typically, I don't need the development kit at runtime. Worth to have a look at. And one other interesting thing here is that the IBM Zemaru is not um, provided for Alpine. Um, I ha I've seen a talk where they said, well, you can create an Alpine image or use the Alpine base image, then install glibc in it, and then you can have glibc with uh, OpenJ9. But that's not the goal. If I add glibc in an Alpine, well, guess what? The Alpine container grows. Um, and there was another ticket in the OpenJ9 space where they asked for Musil support, and the answer from the OpenJ9 team was, no, we're not doing this. And I think the ticket was closed. That means the OpenJ9, if, if my consideration is I want to have a really small size container, then the Semaru is currently not the option. Doesn't mean IBM Semaru is bad um, JDK implementation, don't get me wrong. It's just for the consideration of small image size. So yeah, I'm, I'm, for my tests, I use the 17 JRE Alpine of uh, Tamarine. Some interlude distrulers. When I searched for how to create a small container, I was often told or read, use distrulers. Distroless is, um, well, images contain only your application and its runtime dependencies. It's created by Google, and yeah, it doesn't have package managers or shells or anything, making it really small. Um, they say, okay, the static, so if you push a static application into a, such a container and use the static Debian distroless, well, it's smaller than an Alpine. Of course it is, it doesn't have a shell and it doesn't have a package manager. Um, well, if you need a glibc, you're already at 20 megabytes. And if you want Java, well, that escalated quickly. You already have 230 megabytes. It's still smaller than the Debian-based um, Tamarine. Um, but, well, for Java applications, the, the statement that use a distro less because of the size um, doesn't match really. For security reasons, it might be a good match because no package manager, uh, no shell, so nobody can get into your container and do something there. So for security reasons, a distro-less container is still an option. Yeah, okay. Some best practices, but I, I have to admit I just copied it from the internet um, because everyone is saying the same. Uh, Use a JRE instead of the JDK. Use multi-stage builds. So if you build on one container uh, where you need the JDK, um, use a multi-stage build first build, then copy the result into a production container that has only the JRE if needed. Um, yeah, don't run Java apps as root. Uh, properly shut down. And take care of container awareness. And that is a, a benefit of the uh, IBM Semaru, for example because there is container awareness included uh, in, in the JDK. There are the links where you can read about more details. Um, building Docker images. There are two things, or, or there are two different approaches for building Docker images for Java. The first approach is the Maven first, or Gradle first, means you have uh, the Docker Maven plugin. So here and you use this for the generation of your image. So I can run my Maven build wherever I want, and the result is a Docker uh, image in my local Docker space. Or I can even publish it to a repository. I can run that everywhere. Now, people that don't like Java, and I have heard that there are people, um, 
that more want a Java service implemented by someone else and they want to work on a VS Code or a web application. They don't want to think about how can I build a Java application. For those people, the multi-stage build is probably the right thing. So you provide a Docker image that is set up to check out the sources, execute the build, and in that container, everything is available from Maven to Java to whatever you need. Create the build and then push it to somewhere else. So the developer that doesn't want to take care about the Java build has only to run a Docker build. And of course, and, and I call this the Docker first approach. And of course, you could also mix this and have the Docker first approach, checking out the sources that will then create Docker containers via Maven. But that was kind of a a loop for me and I was not sure of all the networking issues you then might have. So for th my example, I dropped that approach. I'm using the Maven first approach um, and I will show you why in a minute. Um, yeah, here's the comparison of the image sizes and you will notice that there are two more entries now because the J-Link has an option to compress. If my goal is to make it smaller, well, I can enable the compression feature of J-Link. And you see my resulting image is about 30, uh, 53 megabytes. Yeah, if I use the Graal native image with a scratch base image, I'm getting to 38. So that's a real difference. Now to the benchmark. Yeah, okay, I'm not that bad in time. For the benchmark, what I did, I created a small benchmark application with Juxeras whiteboard. It takes a post request at the end um, with a start and a stop time because I'm running my applications multiple times. So my, my application um, that I used for the benchmark is very simple. It takes some OSGI specifications like config admin, declarative services, event admin to verify that everything is working. Um, and there is a shell script inside the Docker that is starting the application 100 times. And inside the application, I, can, uh, I have an immediate component. And once everything is set up, it simply kills the application. So I have a start, stop uh, thing all the time, 100 times. So I can measure how long it takes. And for people that really rely on exact numbers, Probably that example is not a real exact where I can say, okay, it takes 10 milliseconds less or more. There is noise in, in that measurement, but it gives me an indication. And I will show you the indications right now uh, in a moment. Um, so here you can see what I did. Uh, one interesting thing I have noticed is because I added this um, sending of messages um, via the HTTP client, the Java Net HTTP client, um, I needed to modify my um, example or, or the applications. Um, yeah, that's a post request. Um, I had to do several things. I needed to add the core utils package to Alpine because BusyBox, which is the base of Alpine, does only support um, the detail to a second level. But Java applications are not that slow. So I wanted to measure with milliseconds, at least. But that is not supported out of the box, so I needed to install the core utils package additionally to my images. That is about two and a half megabytes, which you can see directly after the benchmark um, uh, packet or the core utils were added. Most of the containers are about two and a half megabytes bigger. Um, yeah, I have the benchmark bundle, which is a few kilobytes that doesn't, uh, that's not really interesting. And I need a shell script support, so the Graal VM native image, I have to use the Alpine because on the scratch image there is no shell. Um, and one thing that is really interesting is, after I added the Java Net HTTP um, module so I can send the messages, the image, even the scratch image, increased about eight megabytes. So every additional module creates, uh, creates quite an effect on the resulting native image that you need to have in, in uh, uh, that you need to consider. So um, the benchmark results. 
Um, yeah, that's a table. What we can see here is, um, yeah, we have those eight uh, things. Um, what you probably notice is, A, we have in the modules, so with the Atomos jar, you can start from a flat class path or you can start from a module path. I was interested in, does it have an effect on the timing if I start from module path or class path? And actually, it has. So if I start from a module path, um, my startup is about 100 milliseconds slower. Um, and the other thing you notice is that I compare a clean startup with a cache startup. If you know OSGI, uh, on the first startup it creates a bundle cache, which is intended to reduce the startup time on the next start. Yeah, we're in a container, so it's probably always a cold start, although you can work with this. So uh, you could also create a multi-stage build, start it there first, and then copy this bundle cache also to the resulting production image. Uh, that's possible. So I, I was really interested how is the effect of a clean start to a cached start. And that's the, the interesting thing is if I use it from a folder base, so Equinox as a launcher, it's, you can see a difference, about 80 milliseconds here. But for the executable jar, there's almost no um, difference if I start clean or not. And even then for the created JLink image, which is clear because I use the executable jar for creating the JLink image, so I would not expect that there is a difference. But what you can also see is that the smaller my image gets, the longer it takes for the startup. The colleagues at IBM was even confused at this point because they said, why is a custom JRE that is reduced to only contain what's necessary, why is it slower than um, starting it with a normal JRE? Yeah, but uh, impressive was the startup time of the GraalVM. I mean, it's native uh, statically compiled, so it starts really in a in, in wink of an eye. Okay, um, conclusion. What I have found out in my research is that it's possible to have all the deployment variants you have for a Java application, also for OSGI. Half a year ago, this would be not possible. There was things done to make it possible. Um, mainly with the BND tools, JPMS support and OSGI Connect. Um, we can see that different deployment variants have different startup behaviors. They are getting slower, yeah, faster I haven't seen. Uh, maybe it's because of the embedded jars in the executable jar and that there's a problem in, in loading the embedded jars. I don't know. Nobody could answer it until now. Um, and, well, I cannot give you the solution. I mean, from looking only at the numbers, yeah, use the GraalVM because it's the smallest size image with the fastest startup time. But that's a very limited view on the topic because I use the small command line application that is, uh, that is an, a one-shot run intended to be deployed for a CI pipeline, for example, process after process. If I want to create a container for a long-running application, like an application server that is there running, maybe IBM Liberty or whatever, it's probably not the best choice to use a Graal VM because the Java VM has a runtime optimization. So the longer an application runs, it can get faster for specific parts. That's the, the runtime optimization of the J, uh, JRE. If you have it statically compiled, there is no optimization possible. It's statically compiled. And, and of course, you, um, yeah, if we have a look at IBM Semeru, for example, I did several tests with Semeru, and yesterday I had a two-hour session with the experts from IBM because I noticed that creating a JLink image with an IBM Semeru has a really bad startup time. It was about two and a half seconds compared to the JLink image created by the Temurin. Um, we were looking into it. We have no clue. I mean, the first question was, is your test case correct? We came to the conclusion, yes, the test case is correct. Did you enable the container awareness features in your JRE that you created? And of course, I did not. I wasn't aware of them. They told me some of them. Um, and I need to test this and add this to my repository. 
So you can see um, the effects once I have added those optimizations. For example, uh, you can enable container awareness, you can enable uh, the shared classes, and so on. So the OpenJ9 has several options to optimize your runtime behavior and your startup behavior. And I want to add this to the test. Um, you can modify the garbage collection, of course. And there's one interesting thing I was also not able to look after. It's the checkpoint and restore stuff. Unfortunately, the guy who wanted to present it, Java on crack today was not able to join. Um, it basically means you're creating a checkpoint on a Linux system in the user space. It's a CRIU, checkpoint and restore in user space. So you can create such a checkpoint and take the data into the, your production container and then start your Java application from that checkpoint. The measurements seen so far are very promising because they're almost in the scope of the, um, of the GraalVM. But you're having the runtime optimization still. So um, after some reading and discussions, I probably the usage of a, um, of a J-Link image of your application with a checkpoint and restore feature would be the best fit because it's small, it starts up fast. Um, and you have the runtime optimizations. But the checkpoint and restore stuff is currently in a beta phase because it needs really the newest, hottest stuff from Linux in Docker and so on. Um, and that's why I have not tested it yet. But I wanted to add this to my observations. Um, you find all the sources of the benchmark uh, on my repository. There is a huge readme file with much more details if you want to follow, if you want to test with a different JRE um, and do other comparisons. So you find everything there. And with this, I'm only one minute over. Are there any questions? Yes. Sorry? How many buttons do you have on the application? In the application you the okay, so the question was how many bundles does the application have? It's about 20, 25. So it's really just um, the, the basic spec, um, uh, config admin, event admin, DS. It's the system bundle, of course, uh, the, the OSGI uh, bundle. Um, and I have created, I think it's one API and uh, some services for the testing. And it's the Google shell, of course, for the verification. Any, any further questions? Okay, then. Thank you. <laughs>